Today I'm speaking with M.M. McCabe. She's Emeritus Professor of Ancient Philosophy at King's College London, a co-founder of the charity Philosophy in Prison, and a Fellow of the British Academy. If you enjoy this episode, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's been very interesting already <laughs> this yes. morning. We've just had to move room a couple of times, but we've managed to. Today. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing very well. The sun is shining, and we're going to talk about philosophy. What else? What else could be good? <laughs> so I want to go back in time a little bit to when you were younger. Mm. So children are sometimes referred to as kind of being natural philosophers, they're very inquisitive, they like mm. to ask lots of questions, why this, why that, what were you like as a child, were you, were you like this? I think so, I think I was, I, I think I was a nuisance, not to my parents who were inquisitive too in lots of ways, but I think at school I was a pain in the neck, so that my first memory of all of this is on one occasion when I was supposed to be at a swimming class in a river in Oxford and I was told by the teacher, oh, you've got it, because they didn't know whether I could swim or not. So they said, swim that way. And I believed she had said I had what I thought was a justified belief or what I thought was a pro belief that she'd said, swim that way. So I swam that way and that way, it being a river, there was no bottom. So I put my foot down, having failed to do the swimming all the way along, and started to drown, and they had to fish me out. And as happens when adults are not necessarily done the right thing, they were very angry with me. And they said, why did you swim that way? How disobedient you are. We told you to swim the other way. And I said, but I believed you told me to swim that way. Well, if you... If you believed it, if you only believed it, why didn't you ask us? And I said, no, 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 I really believed it. I really was sure that I was going to... And they said, well, you can't have been sure because you were wrong. And I couldn't, I didn't, I was seven or eight, I didn't have the language to be able to say to them, no, I was absolutely certain I didn't have any reason to ask anybody to check. And the, I, so I was, start, I was interested in epistemology from that moment on. Um, so that was part of it. I was brought up as a Catholic and Catholicism is a metaphysical challenge. <laughs> so I was at a non-Catholic school for most of my, uh, Oxford High School for most of my um, school years from nine onwards. And because it was a non-Catholic school, we had to... Uh, I had to have a, a, a sort of religion lessons out of school with Mother Timothy on uh, revealed religion. And that was about metaphysics, you know, transubstantiation, the problem of the Trinity, uh, epistemology, questions about papal inf infallibility, all of those questions. And they were asked because Catholicism at that point was as it were, in battle, because I was part of a very small minority and a rather in battle minority. People were very, sometimes very antagonistic towards my Catholicism. They, it, it was seen as important that I understood what the explanation was. So that was what I was doing. It was wonderful. I loved it. Um, so, yes, I was... A philosopher from the very beginning, I think. <laughs> so you were interested in philosophy, but when you actually went to Cambridge to your undergraduate, you chose classics. Mm. Why, did, why did you choose that? So my mother was a classicist, so I was brought up, really, to assume that I should be able to read Latin and Greek. Um, I, we talked about... I, she used to tell me stories from the Iliad, and in fact, I... My first ever book was a wonderful, tiny volume called Stories from the Iliad, which I still have. Um, and so I, I, that just felt natural. And then I had a wonderful teacher when I was, must have been 
16, 15, 16, Catherine Ross, who was the daughter of the great uh, philosopher and Plato, an Aristotle scholar, David Ross, um, uh, and she and I read Aeschylus's Agamemnon, which is one of the hardest of the Greek tragedies linguistically, um, and uh, Plato's Symposium together. And the Plato, I suddenly realised what this was about. You know, what? Wait, this is this is about ideas. It's about ideas in discussed in a community. It was about different points of view about all the ideas that were being discussed. So I, I that felt comfortable and right. And I went to then went to Cambridge, read classics at Cambridge. And I had, I was in a women's college, so we were only, you, you couldn't go to a mixed college in my day. So I was at Newnham, and I had a phenomenal mentor at Newnham, Joyce Reynolds, who taught me ancient history and taught me about how to deal with different points of view on an event. Um, and then I had a philosophy teacher, Dennis O'Brien, who made me think about philosophy afresh. So that was wonderful. Then I did a PhD in, philosophy, in classics, which I hated. Um, I couldn't, I, I couldn't get a grip on what I was doing and it was very isolated. Uh, so for six years, I, you know, I'd see my supervisor once a month or once every two months, but no seminars. There began to be seminars eventually, but not enough. Nothing to, to make the excitement happen. There was no excitement. And it was very, it was very male orientated. Somebody said to me once when I was a when I was an undergraduate, oh, you're going to do philosophy, you can't do philosophy, you're a woman. And I thought, yes, I bloody can. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> um, but that was, a, there was a long period in all of my Cambridge years when I didn't speak. You know, in seminars I didn't say anything. I thought I didn't have a voice or I didn't think I had a voice. Um, so I never really, I never really got engaged with the stuff that was going on for all of that time. Um, and the, some of the attitudes were abusive um, in ways that I don't need to trouble you with. But that, my experiences of that as a graduate student meant that I thought that the only reason I was there was because I was a female body, not because there was anything going on in my mind that mattered. So that it, it diminished me for a long, long time. Um, until in 1990, I mean, that lasted for a long time, and lasted until I came to Kings, where I realised that there's a difference between... this. That was when I moved into a philosophy department, right? So I've been in a classics department all that time, you know, teaching Greek and Latin and, as well as philosophy. When I came to Kings, I moved to a philosophy department and it was the first time I had understood that somebody could say, Instead of saying, you, you make a remark about something and somebody would say, well, that's wrong because. The sort of combative, diminishing version of it was not like that when I came to King's. So when I came to King's, it was an, a department full of people who were interested, interesting, and who said, oh, that's interesting. Well, maybe it would be even more interesting if you say this other thing as well. And... I cannot tell you how extraordinary it was no longer to feel diminished and to feel myself part of a community that was absolutely incomparable in my experience and ever since has been, I think. 
uh, in my experience as a community of philosophers dealing with each other with respect and enthusiasm, right? We'd have parties and people would be drawing pictures on the whiteboards on the walls to explain something about something really complicated in whatever it was they were talking about. And it was like that all the time. And it, it came, I, I think I should name check this, it came from Mark Sainsbury, who was the head of department when I first came here. And he made it like that. And I think it's been like that ever since. Mm. What do you what do you think it was about Mark that made this such a different environment? He listens. He's he takes it serious. He's very respectful of other people. He takes it seriously. He listens really carefully and thinks about the shapes of what you're trying to say. If you're trying to say something and you don't get it right, he helps you to get it right. He's, um, and he's very calm. So when I, I'm not a very calm person, so I'm kind of uh, like this. And he would just make it calm. And it was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. Mm. Do you think on the whole then, philosophers are more combative and compete, competitive with each other than collaborative? No, I don't. Um, I think there are some traditions in philosophy. I don't mean the analytic tradition as opposed to the continental one, but I think that sometimes competition gets entrenched in the culture in particular places. Um, my experience of Kings and of London in general was that it didn't. It wasn't like that. It wasn't... Um, it was... I can't quite think of the right words. It was, it was, it was kind of enlarging. It was, oh, let's make more of this. Let's make this more interesting than, even than it was in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, I think it's always been like, I don't know how to explain it, mm -hmm. um, but I was, it was the most, it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me when I got the job here. So you focused a lot on ancient Greek philosophy mm. in your career, Plato, Socrates, these, these kind of characters. What, what is it about them that captivates you so much? The first thing perhaps is the perspective. So, I mean, I sort of fell into it, right? Because I was a classicist. And that was the philosophy that was in front of me. So I fell into it and was always interested in it. So there, there wasn't a moment when I sort of said, oh, right, I think I'm going to do this. It just sort of happened. But there's something about thinking about a question that we think is... Let me see if I can put this carefully. There are all the, que the, all the familiar questions that we ask about we ask in philosophy questions about knowledge, questions about reality, questions about uh, value. Um, and we think that they're always the same questions. But when you put yourself into the place, I mean, we can't do it, but if you, when you try to put yourself into the place of somebody who's asking questions that are similar but different so that you see them from a completely different point of view. Uh, so uh, I'm not really, I did once for a long and for a long time think, oh, well, you know, you start with Plato because he was better than everybody else and he had all these ideas and, you know, whitehead stuff about everything being a footnote to Plato. I think that's not really what I think. What I actually think is that it, it, the Platonic Dialogues are this explosion of excitement about any idea that is trailed across the path in front of you. And you can always see it from a strange point of view. Um, and that seems to me to be a way of making philosophy live rather than 
killing it off. I think the other, th the other thing that I'm interested in is the ways in which Plato in particular, but Aristotle too, tackles the question about how you write philosophy in ways that get the reader to do it. And Plato himself has a puzzle. There's, in the Phaedrus, there's a long passage about, well, uh, it, of course, the trouble about books is that they're kind of fixed. And so they're not flexible enough to have a conversation and uh, they can't defend themselves. So actually, you shouldn't really trust what you read in writing. And that's said in writing, right? So we're supposed to notice the mode of the mode by which this is presented. Um, and uh, the, the sense that you have when you r read sort of a, a maxim that Plato wrote nothing in vain. So when you read a platonic dialogue, actually I think all the words matter. So the beginning of the Republic, oh, yesterday I went down to the Piraeus. Why does that matter? Well, I think we need to try and figure out whether it does, why it does, what it's doing, if it's, if it's doing any philosophical work. So the thought would be that one figures out, and it's not treating the Platonic Dialogues as literature, but treating the way they're written as philosophy. And I think that makes them uh, richly exciting. Were there any um, specific ideas or questions that the ancient Greeks explored that really appealed to you? Y y yes. So I'm interested... It's a really good question. I mean, apart from saying all of them. So I'm interested in metaphysics. I'm interested in a lot of the weird metaphysics. I mean, there's some really seriously weird metaphysics, in, especially in very early philosophy. You know, Parmenides, all there is is one, something or other. Um, but at, at the moment, I'm particularly interested in two different things. One of them is the ways in which the Greek tradition is very dominated by puzzles by paradoxes. So paradoxical thinking is very early in the Greek tradition. Um, you know, starts with Heraclitus and Zeno and Parmenides, and they're all they're all chucking things at you that it's impossible to believe. Right? You're, no, 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 no. I can't believe that. And the 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 drive that comes from that psychological effect. I find very interesting. I think it's very exciting, and I think it allows you to develop in the way you think in ways that are that allow for, as it were, the autonomy of the reader or the audience or whatever, which I think is important. Um, I'm also interested. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in at the moment is the ways in which Ancient philosophers are, are interested in some of the starting points of questions in ethics and in politics, where you start with what I call the wandering we, where you start with the first person plural. With, what do we do? How do we approach each other? So it's... It, I think that there are large swathes of ancient philosophy that don't start with the ethical problem of, oh, crikey, you know, oh, well, we're all frightful egoists. How can we work out how to become altruists? And those kinds of questions that are... I don't think the questions are quite like that in antiquity. Yeah. Some of the starting points are different, and I think that's exciting to see how those starting points differ. So you spent a lot of time thinking and reading about ancient philosophy. Have any of the questions or ideas from there affected your life outside of work and academia, affected the way you look at the world? Well, look... I, d 
I think I don't think there's a sort of gap. Um, I mean, that's not to say that I sort of spend my life going around thinking about whether things are real, right? But I, I do, I don't think, I, I think it's kind of seamless. Um, I'm writing something at the moment on <clears throat> how you could ever, uh, from scratch, figure out the rules of logic. And there's a platonic dialogue which I'm obsessed by called the Euthydemus, which is about sophists. And I think that dialogue is about how you explain the nature and the rules of thought and how you integrate those rules with, con with conditions that are actually evaluative, conditions that are connected to the way we live the best life, those kinds of questions. And I think there's a connect, I think Plato has actually nailed it, that he's got all sorts of things to say about how you can't answer questions about logical rules, for example, a question about, for example, the puzzle about consistency. Why does consistency matter? His answer to that is consistency matters because of the person who is, of whom consistency is demanded. And consistency is demanded of that person because of what it is to be a person. So he, he, kind, of, he kind of anchors the question about logical rules in questions that are profoundly evaluative. That seems to me to be very exciting and uh, unusual. And people don't think Plato could do argument. And Jonathan Barnes thinks that Plato is rubbish at argument. I think Jonathan is wrong because I think he, Plato has a better um, understanding of the nature of argument than is normally, than people normally let on. That was a very elaborate answer to a very quick question. I think it just, it, it's everywhere, right? Mm. I was once, so I had a wonderful episode in my life when um, after I finished the PhD that I didn't enjoy doing, I spent a year at Harvard. And during my Harvard year, I did a, I, did, I learned logic because I hadn't done any philosophy formal philosophy before. So I learned formal logic from Quine and then did Quine's graduate course. And I did Rawls's political philosophy course and then I did Rawls's graduate course. And the Quine was just unbelievably wonderful. Um, and I got to the point where I was so obsessed with this work that I was doing. I was married at the time to a man who was a sociologist. He was in the sociology department. And he got really fed up with the fact that I was obsessively, I was doing logic prep all the time. I was doing all and I was completely obsessed with it. And there was one, the philosophy, the, the first, the, the, the preliminary logic course, which so excited me, was called Phil 140. That was his his name in the catalogue. And one evening we were having dinner and he said to me, pass the salt. And I said, which salt? And he lost his reason. He said, don't you fill one for me? <laughs> and it was, <laughs> it was just, it was an obvious question to me, but he was so infuriated by the whole thing. <laughs> So you clearly think it was on your mind all the time. All the time. Is philosophy on your Still mind? Still is. Still yeah. all the time. So I think so. You think about it all day. Well, I, I'm not sure that I... It's it. Hmm. I just... I'm puzzled about things a lot. Um, I'm interested in other people. I'm hugely interested in other people. So I'm kind of nosy. So I'm interested in why people do things and how they do it and how they talk to each other particularly interested in how people talk to each other mm. and what happens when they do what what makes it okay 
when people talk to each other. So when you and I are talking to each other, what's the difference between that conversation kind of going through and it failing? And I don't think that we can explain that without thinking about... We can't, you can't explain it in purely cognitive terms, it seems to me. There have to be other evaluative features of having a conversation with somebody that mark out when it works and when it doesn't. Mm. Um, so that kind of goes on all the time. I, I kind of worry about things like that constantly. Can you say a bit more about that example? Why is it that you couldn't explain that in purely cognitive psychological terms? What, what, what's missing? What about something like um, attitude, the attitudes that we have to each other? Right? So if we have a, if we, I could, ex, supposing it were possible for me to explain a point to you in clear, for you to hear it and for you to explain it back, explain your one back to me, and it could all be written out in clear. Um, that doesn't, maybe the first thought is that it just doesn't happen. But second of all, actually much more happens than that, than explaining things in clear. So the, think about the difference between conversations that work and the ones that don't. So some conversations go somewhere. Something happens you, you, and you can feel the difference. Um, and that seems to me to happen when all sorts of relations are already in place. So I think one might think about this in terms of um, epistemic emotion. I think that's a helpful feature of it. It's not just the cognitive content or the, or the cognitive capacity. I think there are attitudes that affect how we talk to each other that are not that, that are not things that we should ignore. I mean, some of part of that is questions about things like epistemic injustice. So, you know, supposing we're sitting here having a conversation, and I know damn well that um, you're not paying attention to me because I'm female, for example. Or put it the other way around, supposing we were having a conversation and you know damn well in that conversation that I'm not paying attention to you because you're young and I'm old. Any of the so those kinds of injustices have to be got round somehow, but they have to be got round in ways that are complex, not simple. It's no good my just saying, well, well, I'm it doesn't matter that I'm a woman. It's no point you just saying to me, it doesn't matter that you're younger than me. What matters is that we come to see each other as as proper participants in the conversation. And I think that is... I think it's important. I also think it's um, something that you can change. I think it's something you can come to understand and then to understand better. And I think then what happens is it makes a difference. It makes a difference to me. If I think that we've had a conversation where we've understood each other, even if we don't agree. But the difference that it makes isn't purely cognitive, I think. I think it's evaluative. So, so you know, the, the trivialising way to think about it would be that what it does is make, it, it puts it in a context of respect, for example. Mm -hmm. Puts it in a context, sometimes it puts it in a context that's free from antecedent. You know, you leave your bags at the door. You come into a room and leave your bags at the door. Something like that. Now, if that's right, if there's anything in there that's right, then actually, the two, maybe two obvious things follow. One of them is that we need to then understand that better and to pay more attention to it. Uh, the other thing would be that the 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 ways in which some contemporary discourse 
damages the way we think or damages the way we talk to each other is much more damaging than just thinking about, oh, well, you know, somebody told me a lie. That's not all that's going on here. So, for example, when politicians lie, we know that it's not just a question of them, them not telling us a fact that, about a fact that's actually out there. It's also a question of damage in terms of trust, damage in terms of reciprocal relations, and all of those features of our public lives are connected to, as seamlessly as it seems to me, to, the, to our private conversational lives. Sorry, I've rabbited on too much. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to move on now to ask you about your work with the charity Philosophy in Prison. Mm. So can you tell me a bit about what the work is that you guys do there? So that's kind of connected, right? Mm. So, well, I'll tell you about how it's got set up. So in about five years ago or so, um, I was having a conversation with one of my former graduate students who was doing some extraordinary work on Aristotle, but said to me in a conversation, I, I want to make this matter. And at the time I was in Princeton and they had, they were running at that time a fantastic course in a local prison in philosophy. And I'd been talking to some of the graduate students in Princeton about it. And I said, look, why don't, I said to this graduate student, former graduate student, I said, why don't you do that? Uh, why don't... Uh, why don't we write to some prisons and get something set up and then you go do it. So he did. <laughs> and so his name is Mike Coxhead and he began the work in uh, uh, Her Majesty's Prison Belmarsh, which is a, a difficult, complicated, important, significant prison in London. And he and two colleagues ran a course there that was incredibly successful. Um, and we carried on supporting what he was doing. And then one of my King's colleagues sadly died, Alan Lacey. And Alan left some money in his will for what he, what he explained to me before he died was for philosophy in the world. And I was the trustee for some of this money and I said, ah, now I know what we should do with this chunk of money. So we used the money to set up this charity. So we set the charity up in, it was finally launched in 2018. And so we support the work now that Mike was already doing in Belmarsh and in various other places. Um, and then it, it got shut down, of course, during the lockdown because we couldn't go into any prisons. So during that period, we were trying to send in pieces of paper. So you know the, one of the uh, puzzles, Start the sentence again. Um, what we try to do, if you think about the terrible situation of the prison population in this country at the moment, prisons are overcrowded, the resources are very limited, um, it, it, whatever policies may be in place about rehabilitation. It's very difficult to see how those policies are put together. Um, it, 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 it's very hard to see how we're doing anything other with the people that we imprison than throwing away the key. And I don't believe we should throw away the key. Um, I wrote my PhD on the philosophy of punishment, and so I'm interested in that question, as it were, in philosophical terms. But in human terms, 
We cannot do this. Cannot, you know, whether we're dealing with a habitual criminal or whether we're dealing with somebody who's committed what I think of as a tragic crime. So tragic crime, somebody who just does one appalling, appalling thing after which their life is completely and irrevocably damaged. What do we do? Do we just throw them away? Well, I don't think so. It doesn't seem to me okay. And a huge amount of work done by educational, a lot of them by educational charities in order to help the people who are inside. One of the problems is that the, there's a, there's an obvious problem for prison education, which is that some of the people who are in prison are um, yeah, white collar criminals, should we say. They're people who are um, well educated, they're fraudsters, they're whatever, money launderers and all this kind of stuff. Uh, those, they are able to access various kinds of resources. They're able to read. But there are other people in prison who are educationally disadvantaged. Not, let us emphasise 10 million times, not stupid, but let down by the system that got them in there, right? So maybe they can't read, maybe they don't want to read, maybe they never had an education, maybe they left school um, without any qualifications, which means that they're already in a difficult situation it, and in a country where inequality is growing by the minute this is just getting worse so one of the things so this goes back to what i was saying about conversation so one of the thoughts that we have is that we offer courses which are not lit, not done with texts they're done with puzzles so you you, you, you you find a puzzle and you go and you talk to people about it. And we send groups of volunteers into prisons and they do 10-week courses covering a whole series of philosophical questions. But the crucial thing, I think, is that what you... It, it's what I was saying earlier, that you, you close... You, you go into the room where the philosophy is going on and you close the door. And it, this isn't you know, this isn't kind of loaded with somebody's uh, with somebody's sentence plan or with somebody's conviction rate or with their parole board hearing. What it is is just people talking about philosophy. And the great thing about philosophy is that nobody gets it. <laughs> right. So if you ask somebody a really difficult, so supposing you ask somebody about you know, what's known as the hard problem of consciousness. Well, none of us can answer it. So the advantage then is that nobody in the room is privileged. So it's, a, you know, some teaching do, is sort of top down. But what we try to do is have it, as it were, uh, on the level so that everybody's puzzled about it. So. So that's how, that's the sort of plan about it. During lockdown, <laughs> we, we were completely stuck because there's no internet, but it's a bit so the security reasons you can't get into that prison. So we couldn't do things remotely. We've organized some, um, uh, we, we did, made some television programs which are, which are broadcast by a, uh, an app called Way Out TV, which are visible on prison television. Uh, in those prisons that have Way Out TV, we've also got some material on a thing called Coracle Inside, which is which give out tablets to prisoners, and there's some material on there. But the trouble is, again, that's for people who are already literate, already engaged. You need the people on the ground to do it. And one of the other things that we did was we made these things called philosophy pages, which we were actually sending physical pages to prisons in a sort of chunk because they couldn't get them any other way. 
And one of the puzzles that we say, so the puzzle that we began with is the puzzle that philosophers in their sort of snooty way talk about Theseus's ship. But actually, most people are interested in the puzzle of Trigger's broom. So Trigger is a character in uh, 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 Only Fools and Horses. And he has a broom and he gets given a, he works for council and gets given a, a medal by the council for having had the same broom for 20 years. But it turns out that actually he's replaced this, the, 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 the pole many times and he's replaced the head many times. So there's a question about whether it's the same broom or not. Now, interestingly, I visited a prison where we had not been in um, earlier this year, I think, or late last year. And I was talking to people as I went around the prison. I'd meet prisoners and they'd say, well, I was introduced to them as somebody who's going to do philosophy in prison. They'd say, well, what's that? So I'd ask them about Trigger's broom. And they all knew what it was. And they all had a view. And they were all... So I did a sort of, a sort of off-the-cuff session with five of the high-security prisoners in the prison for 40 minutes, just off the cuff, they were, well, no, I don't think that's right. Well, somebody, one bloke said to me, well, yes, of course he deserved the medal. He did all the work. <laughs> it was completely brilliant. And that's, that's what, it, it, the, the sense of, um, liberation is the wrong word, but the sense of engagement is completely extraordinary. And some of the feedback that says, well, um, uh, this, so there's one heartbreaking piece of feedback from a woman from Danview who said, this is the one thing that has put light in this dark place. And that, <laughs> we have no idea what we do to people. Um, so we try, that's what we're trying to do. You can't say, that talking about philosophical problems, puzzles, makes people better people. Can't say that. But you can say that it engages them, at least for the hour that they're in the room, and if not, for longer. And the, the feedback we get is that actually, if you think about the sort of standard view that you'd have of a sort of prison landing, you know, and somebody would be having an... All the stories we get told about violence and stuff in prisons, that a disagreement can issue in violence. And we were, we've were we been told on several occasions that actually the consequence of the philosophy sessions is that somebody, instead of, instead of going like this in response to a disagreement, they go, why? Well, why are you doing, why do you think that? Now that's amazing. It's not a promise, right? The only thought is that this will treat people as people, treat people as agents in their own right within the room, but also that it will, that it's exciting. What have you learned about prisoners and maybe just society in general from your experience teaching philosophy? to prisoners? Well, I suppose it's confirmed a lot of the things that I knew already. Um, so another piece of my background is that my mother was a criminologist as well as being a classicist. So my childhood was actually full of people who had just come out of prison. Um, who would turn up at the doorstep and my mother would sort of sort them out. So it, it was, it, the, the idea of people inside and outside prison was a familiar feature of my childhood. Um, um, so it confirms that, that there's nothing, there are, I think there are some, seriously bad and seriously dangerous people in the world. Some of them are in prisons, some of them are not in prisons, um, as we know. So I'm not denying 
the problem of evil because I think there is a problem of evil. Um, but mostly what we are seeing it are people who are damaged by forces outside their own control, disadvantaged, whatever. So I've learned something about... I've had confirmed something about the ordinariness of people who are in prison. I've also seen vividly the damage. I mean, if you go into a women's prison, for example, and I'm not suggesting for a minute this is limited to women's prisons, but it's in lots of ways is more evident in the women's estate because maybe because women talk about it more readily. But the the, the antecedent damage of abuse and hardship is something that we should be ashamed of. Um, so there's that. It hasn't changed, but it's been, you know, I've seen more of the things that I think are valuable to see. People. They're in prisons, but they're people. And, may I say, some of the extraordinary people who work in prisons. Um, you know, sometimes it's the governor, sometimes it's, it's one of the prisons we're working in at the moment. The education uh, uh officer who's actually governor standing who is Im amazingly positive and, and enriching sometimes it's a prison officer who just wants to press this idea um, so one woman who is at, a, at the moment at HMP Stafford just extraordinary in her um, approach to how positive all of this is so all of those wonderful things, at the same time, I've learned more about the failings of society, the failings of government. The most recent prison white paper of this government um, is proposing to build super prisons in isolated places, because of economy of scale, of course. And they claim that the super prisons will be internet connected, which will be much better for educational reasons. But of course, super prisons are not easy to visit. So the f damage to the family, I mean, one of the problems for a lot of these people is the fracture of their family life. And we need to do something about it that in ways that would better emulate some of the things that they do in Sweden and Norway rather than what we do here. Um, but in, in addition to building these super prisons, they're building 20,000 more prison places. That is not the answer. That cannot be the answer that actually we have as a strategy to put more people in prison. We need to be thinking better about why it's ending up like that. What is it that's happening? Why are we, why are we reduced to imprisoning people instead of thinking about other ways of helping them? Why is it that we get to that point in some cases? It's a, it's a, it's a gesture of authoritarian despair just to turn around and say, well, we're going to build some more prison places and we're going to shove some more people in them and they're going to be in super prisons out of the way so we don't need to think about them. We need to think about it. We need, we need, I think we need local prisons if we're going to have a prison system, local prisons so we don't think it's nothing to do with us. But most of us think it's nothing to do with us. Most of us say, oh, I don't have to think about that because they're somewhere else. No, they're not. So that's what I've learned. Mm -hmm. What do you think can be done to improve people's understanding of, yeah, I guess, the issues within the system and how we can change things so that things like super prisons don't come about? Well, <laughs> I mean, there are political answers there, um, which are kind of obvious. You know, you need to have a government that takes 
a constructive view to these questions. You need to recognise the that the causes, some of the causes of crime, are inequality. This is a country in which people can't eat and keep warm. That, <laughs> you know, that's what we need to start with. Then we need to start. So here's a, a different take on it. Think about education. A lot of the problems that we're looking at here are because people are bored, they're disenfranchised, they're disassociated. If we had an education system that worked, where people were not bored but interested in stuff, it, w things would be different. Not... I'm not suggesting we can make everybody good people because I don't think that's a reasonable thought, but we can improve things. One of the things that I think we haven't thought about fully um, is the effect on... Edu the really dangerous effect on education of a very narrow test-based national curriculum not interested in all sorts of the things that might light people's minds up. You can't tell what's going to light somebody's mind up. So you, you, you proliferate interest. You don't narrow it down and you, sure as eggs is eggs, don't keep examining people because as soon as you examine people, there are people who fail. And once somebody fails once, they're set up to fail again and then you lose them. So you find ways of everybody finding something in the education. You pour money into education. You, you get people out into doing sport and music and art and drama and all of the other things that excite people. And then you have another look. Mm. I'm sorry that was a rant, but... No, it's a good rant. Deeply <laughs> felt... <laughs> When you were studying the philosophy of punishment, mm. what ideas or kind of conclusions do you think you came to that you think would be at odds with the typical way people think about punishment? Mm. So Plato was the first person to have a philosophy of punishment, um, or if, if I mean a well thought through philosophy of punishment, and he was a reformist about punishment. A lot of the time, and some of the time in some other places, a retribute to this. One of the things I think we haven't thought through, there's a chap called Joel Feinberg, who wrote in the, I guess, 60s, a wonderful piece called The Expressive Function of Punishment. Somehow or other, we need to figure out that punishment, we could think about, expressing disapproval without feeling we've got to hurt people to do it. That's what became obvious to me. That you, you, you... We shouldn't be trying to fix people up to a... We shouldn't, we shouldn't be trying to fix people up to some, some sort of spurious... Uh, 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 template of what the right sort of member of society should be. That's not okay because that sort of gerrymanders the society that we're going to live in. You allow people the opportunities to become the best person they can be, but you also use the the mechanisms of um, state in order to be able to make it clear how we feel about. Um, how we feel about some kinds of activities. That seems r right to me. It seems right to me that we might f sometimes find somebody who we dare not give freedom to. But we don't have to use pain. We don't have to use this narrow-minded deprivation. And having said that, say again that I think in the prison system in the country, in all sorts and places of the prison system, 
in the parole board, in the, in the um, probation service, and in the prison service itself. There are all sorts of extraordinary people making lives better. But the system doesn't do that. The system is set up to hurt. And I think that's a mistake. And I also think it's wrong as well. <laughs> so the fi final question I wanted to ask you is, what plans have you got for the future with philosophy or your, your prison charity work? Mm. So the prison stuff is growing at the moment like mad, which is wonderful. Now that the lockdown is over, we're able to go into prisons again. And we've got lots and lots of projects going, um, including one which is at HMP Swaleside, which is a very exciting uh, long-term project that we're doing there. Um, we're running at the moment, this is still thinking about philosophy in prison, we're running at the moment a, a, a project called Prison Voices, which is about epistemic injustice and the ways in which the criminal justice system silences people mm -hmm. and how we're able to think our way around that. So that's a long-term sort of two or three year research project that we're in the middle of, which is very exciting as, it, as it's developing. Um, building on all sorts of work, including with great assistance from Miranda Fricker, who started the discussion about epistemic injustice. Um, so we just, that's what we're doing. We need to find a way of funding all of this going forward. So I'm going to have to start fundraising and finding kind people who will give us lots and lots of money. <laughs> so that we can go on doing the project. Um, the philosophical stuff, the sort of non-prison philosophical stuff, I'm trying to write, finish this book that is 20 years late, um, on Plato's Euthydemus, which is about what I think is Plato's... I think it's his, as it were, work on philosophical logic. I think it's quite extraordinary. And then I have another book, that is due from some lectures that I gave um, in California five years ago now, um, which is half written and which I need to finish. Another project that I do did for the University of Edinburgh, which I need to finish. I keep saying that there are things I need to finish. And then we're writing, we were planning a book on the philosophy of prison work. Mike Coxett and James Chamberlain and I are going to write that together. Mm. And then after that, I'm not sure what I'm going to do after that. Mm. <laughs> I'm cultivate my garden, <laughs> play with my grandchildren. <laughs> Lots to do then. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, put, I'll put a link um, in the description to your Philosophy in Prison website. Thank I you. should ask actually if people want to get involved, maybe donate or volunteer or anything. What should they do? Do they you just need to e yeah. email philosophyinprison at gmail.com. Uh, the, the email address. So the, the, the website is www.philosophyinprison.com. And on the website, you can find the places to get hold of me um, through the Philosophy in Prison Gmail account. Um, and if anybody wants to help, Everything is very gratefully, very, very gratefully received. Um, uh, uh, we've got enough to keep going for another year and a half, two years maybe. But there's an awful lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 I hope people can hear both how heartbreaking it is to see inside these places for which we're responsible and how amazing it is to see somebody's face light up under those circumstances. Well, I wish you all the best of your work. Thank I think you. it's amazing what you're doing. <laughs> and with all your books as well. Um, 
And thank you so much for speaking. And no, your story. it's been brilliant. <laughs> thank you, Joe. <laughs> Take care. <Thanks. laughs> I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you enjoyed the human podcast, please consider subscribing. I hope to see you soon.